So uh, the way we've uh, designed this uh, workshop, so we have a series of modules, as you know, and we're going to kick off with a module around chip sequencing and analysis, which is what I'm going to cover, uh, at least the introductory part. Uh, and then we're going to follow that up with a module on whole genome bisulfite sequencing, uh, and then finally on integrative analysis. So I'll, I'll just get right into it. Uh, so what I didn't say in my introduction is my research interest, which is around uh, epigenetics and malignancies. And my lab studies, uh, in particular, we, we focus on cancers that are driven by genetic lesions to epigenetic modifiers. So for example, synovial sarcoma, malignant rhabdoid tumors, leukemias, uh, and those types, of, uh, those types of malignancies. And of course, we use epigenetic um, uh, tools to study them. I've also been part of the epigenomics community for, for some time. I currently chair the International Human uh, Epigenome Consortium, some of you might know uh, of that work, uh, and, the, and I was part of the NIH Roadmap Project uh, that started back in 2008, and this is uh, a, a screenshot from, uh, from some of the work uh, that emerged from that. So that's a little bit of a background of my, uh, uh, my research interests and what I'm interested in. So what I'm going to try and get across in, in, in this module I'm going to do a really brief history of, of epigenetics. I know that there's uh, quite a wide variety of folks in the room. Some of you are just starting your career, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of uh, little background and then try to bring you up to speed on our current understanding of epigenetic mechanisms. Uh, and then I'm going to go into some basic molecular biology, uh, driving massively parallel sequencing, remembering that epigenomic research has really been enabled by, uh, by uh, sequencing technologies. Prior to NGS, uh, Really, uh, epigenetics was limited to some uh, very uh, focused array-based studies. So I think from my perspective, understanding the molecular bi biology as well as the computational side is essential uh, to do your research. So the output of the molecular biology, of course, is the FASTQ file. How many of you guys know what a FASTQ file is? Okay, good. So some of you do, most of you do. So we'll go through that real quick. Of course, that is the output uh, of a sequencing instrument and that that goes into the uh, 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 downstream analysis. I'm going to then go through some uh, challenges uh, and uh, some of the underlying principles uh, of chip sequencing. Uh, and these are applicable both in histone modifications as well as those of you who are interested in transcription factors. I heard CTCF mentioned a number of times. Uh, and then I'm going to go through a very high level overview of the analysis workflow. And then in module two, we're going to get um, into more details in terms of the alignment. So, getting going here, brief history of epigenetics. So epigenetics has actually been around for, uh, you know, almost 100 years. And this is actually the first description uh, of, uh, heter or of um, epigenetic um, signatures within, within the chromatin. And uh, this was uh, a study uh, published in this uh, uh, journal, in a, in actually a, a plant journal, uh, uh, looking at um, essentially uh, stains of, of chromatin uh, in this case, in moss, not in moose, um, but uh, that's my one joke. <laughs> Good, all right. So anyway, so we can divide we can divide the chromatin into essentially two states. We can divide it into what's known as euchromatin. You've heard of this before. That simply means regions that don't take up dye. So euchromatin, open chromatin, and then heterochromatin or other chromatin uh, is the area that is compacted and takes up dye. So divide the chromatin into euchromatin and heterochromatin. So that was really the first description. From there, really, studies in flies started to, to discover that, in fact, the heterochromatin, or these regions of the genome, are actually not static. They're dynamic. And this was studied, uh, again, uh, using in, in, a, in a model system uh, where, uh, through translocation, a gene was actually uh, translocated close to the heterochromatic, euchromatic uh, border. And what was found is that actually, in a non-Mendelian way, this gene was silenced. And of course, many years later, uh, we discovered this was actually due to the fact that the heterochromatin <coughs> itself was spreading into the gene. So heterochromatin and euchromatin exist, but they're also dynamic and they can move around. So a few years later, uh, in 1942, uh, everyone should be familiar with Conrad Waddington. And of course, this is his famous uh, uh, paper, I guess, uh, in, in uh, in, uh, uh, well, in 1942, uh, where he described, first described the, the, the concept of the epigenotype or epigenetics. And he was using this as a way, as, as a way to uh, describe the process where, where genetic or, or genotype uh, gives rise to phenotype. 
and he was using it in the context of the um, uh, uh, of the flywing development. Uh, and the the journal that it was actually published in is called the uh, in the endeavor. Okay, so let's remember that all of this was 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 discussed in the context of not even knowing what the hereditary agent was, and so it wasn't until a few years later, and in, in fact, the next year where the, the classic uh, study uh, looking at S and R forms uh, uh, showed that, in fact, DNA was a hereditary material. Everybody should be very familiar with this. So now we set up the, the, our, our understanding. We understand there's euchromatic, heterochromatic regions. We understand that DNA is a hereditary material. Um, and around that time, people were trying to, dis trying to divide uh, DNA into, into functional units. And of course, using liquid chromatography was one way to do it. Uh, this is paper chromatography, and when this was done, um, what you can see here is that you know the, the various forms of uh, nucleic acids were were separated, and indeed a form uh, appeared uh, which was at the time uh, um, labeled as epicytosine. Uh, but if you actually go into the into the article, this is again published uh, just after we we understood that DNA was hereditary material. Um, it was shown, or it was postulated to actually be um, uh, methylcytosine based on some previous work uh, using tuberculosis. So now we understand that, in fact, there are modifications to DNA, and they actually, uh, uh, at least uh, in, in the context of DNA, uh, are a significant fraction of the nucleic acid content of the nucleosome. So around that time, uh, uh, or a few years later, three years later, I guess, um, uh, very famously, many of you should know Barbara McClintock, uh, and she discovered the fact that discrete elements in the genome uh, have regulatory potential. Uh, again, using model systems, could actually show that these regions would bounce around. These are transposable elements, and these transposable elements actually had discrete regulatory function. And of course, many of you know one of the uh, key uh, findings of our recent work in epigenomics is is the definition of these regulatory elements, whether they be CTCF binding sites, enhancer binding sites, CPG islands, these elements that actually regulate the genome, right? So I would argue that, that Barbara McClintock actually uh, was the first uh, to actually des describe these in any, any, in any way. So around this time, of course, Mary Leon uh, 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 described the process of activation in a single author nature paper in 1961. Uh, and, uh, of course, many of us know, or all of us should know, that X inactivation, uh, of course, is a way of dosage compensation in females, uh, and this is uh, an epigenetic mechanism. And I just, I just uh, when, I, when I Googled her and I looked up her Wikipedia page, I, I discovered that she had what I would consider to be the perfect death. So she was 89, you know, and, and Christmas Day, she had a glass of sherry, ate a sandwich, and then fell asleep in her chair. So I think that's a, a, a pretty good way to die, if you ask me. All right, that's my, own, that's my other joke. Okay, so moving on. So, so now we understand that DNA methylation is in the genome. We understand the concept of euchromatic and heterochromatic breathing. Uh, and we understand the concept of, of that these discrete regulatory elements uh, exist in, in the genome. In the next few years, uh, people started to understand that DNA, me DNA methylation itself regulates gene expression. Uh, and then started to be uh, postulated in the context of differentiation, or this concept of stepwise differentiation from a totipotent cell, so from, uh, from a fertilized cell uh, through to a, a terminally differentiated cell. So there were a number of papers um, by, uh, uh, by researchers at the time who postulated, of course, we had no evidence for this at the time, uh, but that DNA methylation provided this mechanism of stepwise differentiation. And around that time, uh, in, 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 in the field of cancer research, of course, there were a number of uh, efforts uh, looking for cytotoxic agents. And one of the cytotoxic agents that was discovered was 5-azacytidine. 5-azacytidine ended up being extremely toxic at, at, any, uh, at, at any dose, at a very high dose anyway. Um, but people such as Peter Jones and Stephen Balin and many others started to use this at a very low dose. And what they found when they did this in culture at a low dose is it actually drove differentiation. So now we have a, an almost, a, well, a direct evidence that altering DNA methylation is actually driving differentiation. And so this connection between differentiation and epigenetic um, mechanisms uh, came to the fore. So that's a very 
very brief overview of DNA methylation. So now moving up to today, what do we understand about DNA methylation? And this is an excellent review by Dirk Schuber uh, in, in 2015. Uh, if you're interested, uh, this was uh, published in Nature because uh, Dirk has, has made some uh, seminal findings in the area of DNA methylation. So of course, the dogmatic view of DNA methylation is that it's associated with repression. So if we see DNA methylation in a promoter, that gene is repressed. Uh, but that's a very context-specific um, understanding of DNA methylation. And, and as you work in your, uh, in your respective fields, realize that our understandings are continuing to evolve. So we now know, for example, that DNA methylation is also associated with active transcription. So we know that DNA methylation is present within gene bodies. So if you're doing an epidemiological study and you're studying DNA methylation and you find that you have a DNA methylation associated with some phenotype, Remember, it matters where that DNA methylation is. If it's in the gene body, it's probably associated with active transcription. So don't get stuck into that dogmatic view of, of epigenetics. But here are some, some, um, uh, some uh, sort of basic uh, uh, concepts around DNA methylation. So you all know that CPGs are unevenly distributed in the, in the mammalian genome, right? And why is that? I'm going to ask you guys questions. Why, why are genomes un? Un, uh, unevenly distributed in, in the mammalian genome. You guys are all epigeneticists. So is the, is the human genome, AT, what is the ATGC content of the human genome? Or mammalian genomes? Is it 50-50? Not you, Alvin. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Is it is it is it fifty fifty? So is it AT or GC rich? So it's a little AT rich, right? Does anybody know why? Sorry. It's not GC rich. No, it's AT rich. So CPGs have been specifically <coughs> depleted in the human genome, and why is that? Is that because methylated cytosines have a tendency to mutate into? Methylated? That's right. So. Methylated cytosines spontaneously deaminate, right, into thymidines, methyluracil, right? And those are not recognized by the basic scission repair mechanisms, right? And so they, over time, over the eons, have slowly, um, uh, you know, mutated away. However, there are regions of the genome where this has not occurred. What do we call those regions? So regions where the ancestral CPG content of the genome is still there. Sorry? CPG islands, that's right. So just remember when we say, oh, these are CPG rich regions, they're not really CPG rich regions, they're just what we expect, the, what the ancestral genome was. And, and, the, and the reason these things exist, most likely, is because they're under selective pressure. So these spontaneous deamination events are occurring, but they're being repaired because they're regulatory, or at least that's our notion, right? So uneven distribution, um, CPG islands are remnants of the ancestral genome, and they're there because we believe that they're regulatory contents, right? And we see these in regions such as promoters, and in promoters, the majority in a normal somatic tissue are unmethylated, and in gene bodies, they're methylated. Those are some basic concepts around CPG islands. And of course, there's a whole field studying how these become deregulated in the context of human diseases, uh, including, um, uh, including uh, cancer. So if we look genome-wide, however, if you just look at all CPG islands, and there's about 28, or CPGs in the genome, there's about 28 million of them, um, the default state is methylated, right? Somewhere between 70 or 80% of CPGs in the human genome are methylated. And many people consider it actually to be the default state. And the unmethylated state is actually the, 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 the regular, the, the, the information content. Um, as I've already said, tr transcribed gene bodies tend to be methylated. And of course, work out of the uh, Human Epigenome cons uh, Consortium, including the, the Roadmap Project and ONCODE and many others, uh, and including work of Dirks, has shown that active enhancers tend to be hypomethylated. So transcribed gene bodies are methylated, active enhancers tend to be hypomethylated or unmethylated, and people are now using this as a way of defining regulatory states. Uh, and as I said, CPG islands tend to be unmethylated. Okay, but let's keep in mind that DNA methylation is not essential, right? Not essential. So it's true that vertebrates uh, have uh, 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 DNA methylation, both within gene bodies 
and within transposable elements. And so we are vertebrates and we study humans. And of course, uh, mouse is a, is, a, is a vertebrate. But all other model organisms have lost DNA methylation. Okay? So we think that it was present uh, in ancestral, in the ancestor, in the ancestral lineage of all life. Uh, so we know that DNA methylation, for example, is present in, in prokaryotes, used as, a, as an immune system, uh, uh, as it were. Uh, but this has been lost. So C. elegans has lost it. Fruit flies have lost it. So we know it's not absolutely essential. And in fact, if we look at embryonic stem cells, we can knock out all the DNA methylation machinery, DMT1, DMT3A, 3B, and they're fine. They'll, they'll, they're fine in culture. However, as soon as we differentiate them, they die. So we know that DNA methylation is not essential for life, even in a vertebrate cell, even in a mammalian cell, but we know it seems to be essential for, uh, for differentiation. So, and the, the other point I think that is important to keep in mind is that remember that DNA methylation is reprogrammed, and it's reprogrammed twice in, 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 mammalian, uh, in mammalian organisms, once in germinal cell differentiation. Uh, so when uh, when we go from uh, primordial germ cells uh, to mature germ cells, either sperm or egg, we get a, a, a D, DNA demethylation and then a remethylation event. And this, again, occurs just after the zygote. So remember that we have this reprogramming event. And of course, this is relevant for those of us who are trying to understand the concept and the context of epigenetic inheritance, right? And I would say that emerging research is suggesting that at least a part of how that might be happening is actually through histone modifications, not through DNA methylation. And there's some evidence of through that uh, in, in, in model organisms. Okay, so that's DNA methylation. So, of course, we know that, that, uh, that epigenetics is also encoded within the proteins that package the DNA, the so-called nucleosomes. Uh, and nucleosomes, of course, have been known for many years, uh, going back to 1974. Uh, so Roger Kornberg and, and many others have done some seminal work. Uh, in defining the nucleosome structure. Uh, and then in, in 1997, of course, the seminal paper showing the three-dimensional structure of the nucleosome with the DNA wrapped around it. And I wanted to show this, of course, because we're all familiar with the fact that histones, so H3, for example, have these unstructured and terminal tails sticking out of the nucleosome. And of course, it's these unstructural, unstructured and terminal tails that are highly decorated with chemical modifications, such as methylation, acetylation, phosphorylation, ubiquitination, et cetera. Uh, these are where the, uh, the so-called histone code, as David Alice has, has coined the term, uh, are, are laid down. So we know that chemical modifications, and this is just a series of papers, uh, the, the, uh, the, the first descriptions uh, in, in various uh, organisms, um, we know that chemical modifications to histone proteins uh, influence uh, gene expression. This was sh first shown uh, in, in tetrahymen uh, by David Alice uh, conclusively uh, with acetylation. But of course, we now know that there's actually a complex uh, histone code, as I'll talk about. And of course, part of what we do in epigenetics is try to, to try to study this, try to measure this. And of course, chip sequencing, which is what we're going to be talking about today, is one method to do that. So this is actually the, the, the seminal work. Again, Tetra Hyman is a beautiful organism. Uh, and uh, this is a work of David Alice showing uh, the, uh, the relationship between histone acetyl uh, transferases, acetylation of nucleosomes, and then active transcription. Okay, so acetylation of histones, active transcription. That was really the first, dis uh, first description of, uh, in, in the context of gene regulation. So... Um, we now know, of course, that or we have described at least a hundred different uh, epigenetic modifications, a subset of, a subset of which we've studied very intensively. Um, and the list of them are here. These are the marks that are, are most often studied in the context of epigenomic research. So some of the research that I do, and I'm sure many of you in this room are familiar with them. Um, these, uh, they're listed here. Uh, they're associated with both active um, uh, transcriptional and regulatory states, as well as repressed uh, or heterochromatin states. So just to remind everybody how this nomenclature works, so I, hopefully everybody's familiar with this, but of course we're describing the histone first, the, uh, the amino acid that's modified, in this case lysine 3, so histone H3, lysine 3, or sorry, <laughs> lysine 4, uh, and then the, the modification, so in this case um, trimethylation. So we know that H3K4 trimethylation 
is associated with active promoters, right? But we know that, for example, H3K4 monomethylation is associated with enhancers and, and so on. Uh, and, and so uh, in, 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 in regulatory contexts, uh, these, uh, these, modifications, these modifications have been associated with various regulatory contexts, but of course there are many, many more. And one question I get asked all the time is, why do you study those? Why, were, why are these modifications studied more than other modifications? And really what we have to go back to is work um, by Manolis Kellis and Jason Ernst and many others as part of the ONCODE consortium and also as part of the NIH roadmap consortium, which when we initially started working uh, in, in this area, and of course uh, ben Ren, uh, Bing Ren uh, and many others, Brad Bernstein, uh, uh, generated some of the first data sets uh, in this area. But when we actually looked across a whole wide variety, and here we've got, I don't know, probably 30 or 40 different histone modifications, what we saw is that many of these modifications, at least looking here, appeared to be functionally redundant. In other words, if we knew what one was, we knew what all the others were. And so those modifications were selected, rightly or wrongly, under the, the, the apparent redundancy of the histone code. So, so the, the thought is, is by studying that small set of histone modifications that we're actually describing a, a much um, a richer uh, histone modification landscape. Of course, you might ask, well, why are these other modifications there? Are they actually, do they actually have regulatory potential? And I think there, are, there is emerging research that's actually showing this. And those of you, you're all young, early, re in, early in your career, you know, there, there's lots of opportunities to study. What are, what are these other modifications doing, even though they're highly correlated uh, with, with uh, modifications that are currently studied intensively in, in the literature? Uh, many of these modifications may have unique uh, and, and very interesting functions. Okay. Yes, question. Yes. What about this, like, in this cell type or in the TD, these modifications were studied and they characterized that, okay, this. Uh, so they were never, they were only characterized computationally. They were never mechanistically characterized. And most of the studies, the initial studies, were done in, in human embryonic stem cells, and in particular a line called H1, so the line that Jamie, Jamie Thompson, one of the initial human embryonic stem cell lines to ever be generated. Um, so that's where most of the initial data was generated. And if you look at the roadmap, you'll actually find um, all the, well, I think there's about 50, uh, 50 modifications that Bing Ren's group did at UCSD at the time. So if you're interested, it's there. But you're right. I mean, there are, there are what, two, 300 different uh, somatic cell types in, in the human body. Maybe these modifications are playing a role there. Seems unlikely that, you know, why would they be there if they're, they're redundant? Although, you know, functional redundancy is a common theme within the genome, right? We know many times we can knock out one pathway and another pathway can, can functionally uh, uh, replicate it. So, you know, maybe that's true in the histone uh, landscape as well. So I always like to finish my brief history of epigenetics to think about what are some of the major questions in the field. Well, I would say two of the major questions in the field at the moment are one, cause versus consequence. Keep in mind that most computational or almost all computational biology that we do, in, in, at least in the arena of chip sequencing, is all correlative, right? We're correlating the presence of this mark with some other thing, right? A gene expression, a genomic feature, right? It's all correlative. We really don't know cause versus consequence. Is that mark there because RNA polymerase is there, or is that mark there to recruit RNA polymerase, right? So that whole concept of cause versus consequence is still a very open question in, in the literature. And, and keep that in mind as, 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 you, as you work with the, um, uh, with the data. And secondarily, um, or the second major question I would argue, is really the scope uh, so how much transgenerational inheritance actually is there, and, and what are the mechanisms by which this is happening? I already talked about the fact that DNA methylation is reprogrammed, and of course sperm in itself is, pretty, uh, uh, is a unique epigenetic landscape. Most of the histones are lost. It's packed with protamines. So how, how are these signatures actually being, uh, uh, being transmitted transgenerationally? We, we think epidemiological... Uh, data suggests that this is happening, but really the mechanisms by which this is happening uh, remain uh, uh, <coughs> determined, and, and I think are a, a very important field, a very important area uh, in, in the field. <coughs> okay, so that's about the first, I guess, 20 minutes. Uh, so now I'm going to move into how do we measure epigenomic features. So 
Um, and in particular, I'm going to focus on chip sequencing. And of course, uh, Guillaume uh, is going to focus on whole genome bisulfate sequencing. And if there, are other, if there are other epigenetic assays that folks would like to discuss, you know, we're here. I'm happy to discuss them. You know, in the interest of time, I can't really go through, through all of them. So I'm going to focus on, or I've decided to focus on histone modifications. But, you know, uh, we're here for the next couple of days, and I'd certainly be happy to talk with anybody uh, about your individual um, assays. So as part of the, um, well, so let's, as I've already mentioned, um, really the field of epigenomics and, and epigenetic um, measurements was really um, uh, uh, brought to life um, by massively parallel sequencing, okay? So I, I guess everyone in this room, it was almost, you probably were in elementary school, many of you, when, when ma massively parallel sequencing was first um, developed. But of course, this was revolutionary for, uh, for those of us who, who uh, were in the field. And in fact, the, the first assays that were ever run and published on the, uh, at the time, the Selexa platform, were chip sequencing assays. So this is a summary that we published along with the IHEC uh, compendium papers that were published in November this year in, in Cell. Uh, and this just really highlights four different assays, including chip sequencing, all of which depend on uh, massively parallel sequencing. So those of you who work in the uh, wet lab as well as the dry lab, there's lots of scope uh, for essentially generating little DNA fragments uh, that we can sequence in various different cool ways to measure different epigenetic features. Chip sequencing just being one of them. Uh, we can also measure things like, of course, uh, methylation and three-dimensional structure, as well as open chromatin uh, using assays such as a tax seq uh, and, and many others. And again, uh, yeah, happy to discuss uh, the details of that. Okay, so getting into chip sequencing, hopefully most or all of you are familiar with this. Um, so this is a slide I actually made back in I think 2007 or 2008, but it's still relevant today. Uh, so let's remember that the, the genome is comprised of these nucleosomes. Of course, they're not in an ordered array like this, um, although there is some uh, ordering around transcriptional start sites. But we start chip sequencing by shearing the DNA, and this is done in two primary ways, right? We either cross-link the uh, proteins to the DNA, and then we shear them using sonication, keeping in mind that sonication uh, is a single-stranded event. So we clip one or the other, and you have to have two of them together in close proximity. And that has implications uh, as you uh, get into the analysis. Um, or we use something called MNAs, so mononuclease, uh, that can digest uh, in between uh, nucleosome structures. And there's advantages and disadvantages to each of those technologies. Let me just say that for those of you who are interested in studying very small uh, numbers of cells, so in the order of 10,000, 100,000 cells, mononuclease digested chromatin or chip sequencing is the way to go uh, because then you're not dealing with DNA damage associated with um, with uh, cross-linking, and we and many others have published papers uh, that allow that. And in fact, you know, as I think some of you are aware, uh, even Brent Bernstein's group has gone down to single cells, uh, and I'm happy to discuss that as we go through. But two, two basic ways, digestion and shearing, uh, and there are combinations, so some people have done cross-linking and um, shearing, uh, and there's advantages and disadvantages is to each in terms of the downstream uh, applications. Once we have these fragments liberated that are associated to nucleosomes, either in the native state, uh, mononuclease, or in a denatured state, uh, cross-linking, <coughs> we can then use antibodies to enrich. Okay, so then we're essentially just enriching or pulling out these DNA fragments from a population, right? That's all we're doing. We're taking that population that we've enriched, we're, and then we're shotgun sequencing it, and then aligning it back to the genome, as we're going to discuss in detail uh, in Module 2. So what are the key considerations for uh, doing chip sequencing? Number one is antibody specificity and sensitivity. There are currently, uh, we spend more time and money validating antibodies um, than we do using them, than we do buying them, okay? Most of the antibodies that we uh, bring in uh, to the lab uh, uh, fail our validation. Uh, and I'm, again, happy to discuss that. I, I direct something called the, the CERC, or the uh, Canadian Epigenetics and Environment Health Research Consortium. If you go to the epigenomes.ca website, you can go to our, uh, our uh, uh, epigenetic val or our antibody validation page, and you can see the details. And I'm going to go through a little bit of that. So be very wary of the antibody you're using. If you're using the wrong antibody, you've got the wrong specificity, the data you're going to get, obviously, is going to be impacted. 
The second key consideration, what mark should I profile, depends on the question, right? So if you're looking at enhancers, you know, maybe you want to maybe you want to use K27 acetylation, K4 monomethylation. If you're looking at polycomb, trithorax, K4 tri, uh, K27 tri. So this is a, a consideration. What about sequencing depth? Okay, this is another question I get asked all the time. These are the current recommendations of the assay standards group within the International Human Epigenome Consortium dealing with human, okay? This is much deeper than it appears one needs to go for mouse. Mouse is about half of this, and there are a number of studies that have, uh, there are a number of published um, uh, attempts to, to look at um, uh, essentially saturation of histone marks uh, as we go deeper and deeper. For reasons that we still don't fully understand, the human genome seems to behave slightly differently or, or has different um, um, uh, characteristics than we see with the mouse. And in fact, even when we go as deeply as, as 100 million read pairs for a heterochromatic mark like H3K9 trimethylation, we still seem to be uh, uh, capturing uh, new regions in the genome. And those of you who have worked within transcriptional space, for example, RNA sequencing, you know that's also true. The deeper you sequence, the more complexity you actually, actually emerges. Whether that complexity at the very end of the distribution is relevant biologically, I think is, is you know, is, again, is an open question, but one, uh, one, uh, one to consider when you're planning your experiment. So to summarize, in terms of the antibodies, right, garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you're enriching in your fragments, if you're not using an antibody with, with specificity, uh, what you get out the back end is going to be uninterpretable. And there are many issues related to antibodies. Not only can you have um, cross-reactivity, uh, but you can also have antibodies enriching for, for, for other modifications. And so, again, be very wary of the antibody that you're using uh, and do um, uh, perform your own QC analysis of it uh, before you start your experiments. Yes? So you mentioned that 15 million reviews for <coughs> For okay, so what's the difference between paired and so so this is a good point. So read pairs and fragments are different things, right? So read pairs are the pairs. Fragments, of course, are how many actual pieces of DNA do you sequence? And so it's half. So if you were to do single end sequencing, it would be 25 million because you're 50 million paired reads are sampling 25 million fragments, okay? However, I would argue that if you're going to do chip sequencing, you should use paired end reads. The reason for that is because it allows you to define the fragment size. We initially, when chip sequencing was first developed, um, we and others developed, you know, this computational extension where we would take in from the lab the actual distribution that we loaded onto the, to the sequencer, and we computationally extend the single end read to what the average fragment length is. That has some issues, and I think Misha might, might talk about some of that in, in the alignments. But if you've got paired end reads, you can define the ends of the fragment. And that actually gives you a lot more resol resolution. Um, and I would argue, you know, even single end sequencing is probably not going to be something that's going to be around um, for, for very much longer. I think most, most production facilities have probably stopped generating single end sequencing. So it's a good time to, to switch to pair end, right? But yeah, so half half as many. Yeah. Another question. Yeah. Like, uh, what should be the read length for like pair end and single? So, so again, you know, I think these this is this is mostly so we know at seventy five base pairs we're mapping most reads uniquely at least in the human genome. I'm going to stick to the human genome, yeah. but really this is now more predicated <laughs> by the by the vendor. So this is more of a Lumina issue if we're used. Most of us use a Lumina sequencing, right? They're, it's pretty much the dominant platform. And their, their reagents are kitted in seven, you know, paired in 150s or whatever. Uh, and you're going to be, you're going to, the flexibility in terms of read length really isn't there much anymore, uh, in, in, at least in my experience. And I think that's going to become even more and more the case. Um, so, you know, typically I think we're running paired in 125s now um, just because that's the, the, the way the, the, the reagents are kitted. Um, but paired in 75s would be more than sufficient uh, for most applications. However, if you're interested in such things as transposable elements, you'd want a little bit more, like paired in 125s will be useful. Um, and again, that's another feature of paired in reads. When you're looking at repetitive sequences, you can anchor one read in the unique part of the genome, and the other read can drop into the transposon. And then you can actually uh, distinguish between different repetitive sequences. So, okay. So again, I think it's a 
a vendor issue. You had a question, yeah. Um, so the ventilation pattern can, like, can change between cells, even if it's the same type of cell, right? So if you have a monocyte, some cells can have the ventilation that is gone, and some is not, right? True, yeah. Yeah, so would you, would you be, like, advantage to use, for example, single cell sequencing technology so you can, like, Shape, so this is okay. So so first of all, I think our concepts of what a cell is is evolving, in part because of what we've learned from epigenetics, right? So this concept of here's a cell type that we can put in this box, and here's a cell type that we can put in this box, I think has largely gone away. We now know from single from single cell studies as, as well as functional studies, when we actually take those cells and, for example, inject them back into a mouse, that they're that there's a functional distribution. So we actually have a distribution of cells um, that, that exist in these states. So certainly, I think single, single, um, uh, single cell studies are, are an important contribution to the field. In, in our lab, we do single cell DNA methylation. Um, it's very expensive. It's very time consuming at the moment. Uh, we're looking to find ways to make it more effective. Single cell RNA sequencing, of course, is another technology that's out there. But keep in mind that you're only sampling a very small fraction of the transcriptome for any single cell. And in fact, if you go down and you look what you're getting, most of the, you know, the, the key players aren't there because we're not detecting things like transcription factors which, that are expressed at a very low level. So indeed, yes, yeah, single cell studies have, have a place, are, are certainly an emerging area of research, one that, that we've been studying in the context of hemopoietic uh, progenitor populations, which is you know, an area of... of, of uh, uh, great interest in terms of understanding uh, 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 heterogeneity within cell populations because we know functionally, even though we can sort them to these very high purities, that indeed there is still functional differences between them. And when we look epigenetically, they're different. I should say that uh, our work and work of Christoph Bach and Wolf Reich looking at single cell epigenetics, and this is primarily in DNA methylation, shows us that even if we look at two cells, two cells that have been highly purified, about 12% of CPGs are in the opposite state. So there is this a lot of heterogeneity going on there, and I, I don't think we fully understand why that is and, and how that's then um, being collapsed into the, the profiles that we see. But that also gives, that's also an important point to think about when you're doing your research, is that when we generate this data, we're actually doing a consensus, right? So we're doing a consensus of the population, right? For example, DNA methylation is binary. So the concept of 50, you know, of a 35% methylation at a, at a, at a, at a position is, is, is just a reflection of the heterogeneity, right? And when you talk about, well, you know, I've got a 5% change in, let's say, ChIP-seq or this uh, histone modification amplitude or in my DNA methylation, what you're saying is that you've got a change in, in cellular composition, right? Because DNA methylation is binary. So keep that in mind, right? You're looking at a, you're looking at a, at a a consensus of a population, not, not in the individual event. Okay, a any other questions? If not, I'll, I'll move on. So this is, the, this is the validation that we do. This is published. Uh, so we validate both the, uh, both the lot, uh, the catalog number, and the lot. Uh, this is a pat particular antibody that, that made it through the pipeline, but many antibodies from Diageno do not. Um, uh, and uh, again, I'm happy to discuss that. We do both a 384 uh, peptide array, so this is the Agilent peptide array to look at affinity, <coughs> as well as doing a Western blot. And then for every new catalog that we get, we do chip sequencing and we then correlate it back to known. So we have a control data set and there are many control data sets out there. I would highly re recommend you do that um, before you, you embark in a big study uh, with an antibody, right? So validate your antibody. Uh, again, this information is publicly available. ONCODE has published, a, again, a, a, a review of this area and their suggested uh, QC measures, which are in, in align with, with, with what we're seeing here. So this is, what antibody is this? Uh, K4 trimethylation turns out to be a very, um, uh, probably one of the well, most well-behaved antibodies. Uh, each one of these is a different peptide, so you can see the highest affinity is with K4. But we also see cross-reactivity. Um, uh, this antibody, K27 acetylation, is one of the worst behaved antibodies. Very difficult to get a highly specific uh, antibody against H3K27 acetylation. Uh, and this is the uh, off-target effects that are shown here. Uh, so 
arguably, if you're working with H2K27 acetylation, please be very careful in the antibody that you choose and ensure that you've validated it um, uh, appropriately. Garbage in, garbage out. Okay. So sorry, would this pass the validation or not? This one did, yeah. Did. But this is as good as it, I mean, we, we've had one where, where commercial antibody and the first peptide it, and it recognizes a different acetylation moiety. Um, and this is common, unfortunately. And do you see a lot of variation between lot to lot? Yes. Yes. Even, so it's the same catalog number, different lot, which you'd think would be the same bleed if it's a polyclonal, um, but we see different affinities, suggesting that it's actually not the same bleed. Um, and, you know, there are these so-called chipsy gold standard antibodies. As, as my experience has been it's, it's an unsolved problem uh, in the literature. There are monoclonal antibodies that are coming available. So CST has a monoclonal now for H3K4 trimethylation. Uh, that, I think, is, is a very good quality, has been around for many years. Um, but most of the uh, K27 acetylation, for example, is still polyclonal, although there are some uh, monoclonals out there that, that are starting to emerge. If you can get a monoclonal, obviously that's the way to go, um, because then you have a secure source um, uh, uh, for, for replacement. Um, but they have, in, in some cases, monoclonals uh, just don't behave uh, in, in chip seek experiments. Yes? Yeah, one question uh, regarding, uh, so for the Western blood helmets, does it tell you, so if you see uh, any more than one band, you already see? Yeah, so it's a good question. So the, <laughs> the cutoff, and it's, this is just a total arbitrary, is 50%. So we want to see that the, the target band is 50% is or greater. Um, yeah, so... Um, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting when you start to, we, we actually see differences between cell types too, uh, for reasons that we don't understand, um, but that, that's, that's the current criteria. Yeah, not perfect, but it's better than, better than not doing it. So you'll find that some antibodies, you just get a smear, right? So you know that you're pulling down a bunch of stuff. Uh, maybe the chromatin's in there too, uh, but you're pulling down a bunch of other stuff too. So yeah, I, it's, I think it's really important for you to do it before you start your studies. Yes? Yeah, so first of all, you should contact the author and make sure that because this is now mandated by, by the journals, within people that work within the IHEC, this is mandated within the metadata. So we both the catalog and the lot number is provided, uh, as well as how much antibody is used. And, and of course, that's another important criteria in chip sequencing. I'm not going to go through all the molecular biology. Um, so can you trust the, you're asking me, can you trust a publicly available data set? I mean, it depends, right? I mean, but I would, if, if that information is not provided, I would be wary because I would ask, well, why aren't they providing that information? That's like anyone who works in the field, if you publish a paper, you would want to include that, right? So that someone could replicate your data, replicate your study, right? So I would then ask the, the, um, uh, ask the author, uh, if it's not provided for it, um, and, and I think that's the best you can do. Um, but, you know, you can correlate with, with other data and see that this is representative uh, and, and those kinds of things can, can also be helpful. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, moving on. So just as a very uh, kind of high-level overview, uh, this is um, uh, a chip se sequencing uh, processing flow. Uh, so, of course, we start with sequencing, and I'm going to just talk about the Illumina platform, the predominant platform at the moment, although there are, you know, perhaps other platforms coming online, um, but it's still the, the pre predominant ChipSeq platform. So, uh, in Module 1, which I'm going to be talking about, I'm really just going to take the fast cues. It sounds like most of you already know what the fast cue is, so when I ask you questions about it, you're going to know the answer, uh, but I'm going to brief, just go through that real quick. Uh, and then in module two, we're going to go from fast cues to BAMs, which of course are the binary alignment files. So this is the, the output after the alignment, which then gets uh, further processed into such things as WIG files and other representations of the data. And that's what uh, Misha is going to talk about. And then David will be uh, t talking about integration, uh, I guess, in, in module four uh, later, later in the course. So then um, uh, integrating it all together. Okay. So just to remember everybody, chip sequencing, right? Sequencing underpins what we do here. Understanding sequencing uh, is important. Um, and so let's just remember the basic workflow. Um, we can start with any nucleic acid. 
um, in this case, DNA. Um, and we, in this case, of course, we've sheared the DNA using nucleosomes or, or sonication. And then we get a pool of random fragments, um, which we then uh, end repair and ligate. And if we sonicate, of course, we've got these long ragged ends that need to be filled in or chewed back. If it's mononuclease, it's more of a, a blunt end. Uh, we ligate ad adapters uh, to them. And then typically for, for chip sequencing almost exclusively, we then PCR amplify. And at that PCR amplification step, we add our barcode if we're doing, uh, if we're, well, it's very typical now to do that so that we can do multiplexing within a, uh, within a, um, within a flow cell. And everybody's familiar with barcoding, right? Everybody understands that when you're working with a, with a sequencing facility, typically your, your uh, FASTQ file will already be split. So it'll be split on the index. You'll get one FASTQ file or two FASTQ files if it's a, um, if it's a uh, paired end read. Uh, that's already been split by index. So this happens behind the scenes. You don't see it. But keep in mind what's coming off the sequencer is actually three files, right? Your read one, read two, which is actually your index file, and read three, which is your read two, right? Uh, and I'll talk about how those associations are made, just so you, you can understand. Okay, so of course the Illumina sequencing does clonal amplification on a solid surface, on a flow cell, right, on, the, on a solid piece of glass. There are other ways of clonally amplifying DNA molecules. What's the other predominant way in NGS to, to, to clonally amplify these fragments? The key... Um, Characteristic of NGS sequencing. What's the other way that we do this? Anybody? So uh, typically it's done in solution, but you're on the right. You're right that that the sequencing itself is done in micro wells, for example, in the 454 or the ion torrent uh, system, which was life and now is, I guess, Fisher, right? But how is that? So how is that clonal amplification done? Who knows? Not done on a flow cell surface. It's done. Solid sequencing, anyone remember that thing? Same, same idea, right? It's done on a bead, right? It's done on a bead, uh, and so it's done using something called emulsion, where we add a lot of water, or we add our, our PCR brew, our beads, and a lot of oil, and we partition each of the uh, beads uh, and our DNA uh, using an emulsion, right? The problem with that, of course, is that we're using a Poisson distribution uh, to actually get a single bead and a single piece of DNA in a well, and of course, we get a distribution. Many wells have two, three, four, some. Many wells are empty, right? So that's why that technology was really difficult um, to, to apply en masse because we, we needed a lot more material uh, to actually uh, get it, get it to, to move forward. So one of the reasons why, uh, arguably, um, Illumina sequencing has, has predominated in the market, uh, or at least in the research realm. OK, so we ligate the adapters. I've already talked about that. And of course, as you know, we then make a single stranded, so we denature the material. So it's, it's double stranded, we denature it, we flow it over the flow cell surface, uh, and these little colored things, which are a little bit faded here, but essentially you get random hybridization between your ends and, and the molecules that are grafted on the flow cell surface. They're colored here in light blue and purple, right? So we get this grafting occurring, and then uh, through random diffusion, the thing flops over and finds the partner for the other side. So now we have we made a partner, right? So we've got a partner here. This is five prime, that is three prime. That makes a priming event. And then we can just flow over our, our polymerase and our nucleotides and we can make an extension. So now we've made a clonal copy of that DNA molecule on a particular location on the flow cell, okay? And we repeat that process 30 times uh, using isothermal PCR. So we essentially denature, do it again, denature, do it again. And we get these clusters, okay? And these clusters exist um, again, in discrete locations on the flow cell surface, okay? And there's about a thousand molecules per cluster, okay? So that's how we generate these clusters. Now they're single-stranded, uh, and then we can start the process of sequencing. So again, now zooming in, we've got our three-prime end of our, our fragment. We add our primer, um, and then we add our nucleotides, right? Of course, um, well, I'll talk about that in a second. So we add our nucleotides. This should be all be review for everybody. Um, and of course, they're incorporated. Uh, or a base is incorporated uh, by uh, sequence by synthesis. And of course, the other technological advance of, of Illumina or Selexa at the time was the concepts of reversible terminators, right? So these nucleotides are terminated, not like Sanger sequencing where they're dideoxynucleotides and permanently terminated, they're reversibly terminated. 
So they only incorporate one at a time, whereas other technologies, such as 454, such as ion torrent, are not terminated nucleotides. So if there's a string of, of a homopolymeric stretch, you're going to get two, three, four, five, six nucleotides all incorporated. And the reason why those other technologies have high indel error rates is because you can't control, or it's very difficult to estimate, once you get past three or four nucleotides, how many have been incorporated. So the other major advance of this sequencing technology is reversible terminators. So you incorporate one, uh, you wash away, so you so-called flush and then scan. Uh, we then uh, illuminate with a laser, uh, detect the signal, uh, and then start the process again and again. So then we're building up this, um, this cluster, uh, one nucleotide at a time. So how do we actually call the sequences? So we start with the first image, uh, and we generate what's called the focal map. Okay, the focal map is important, and it becomes important later on, which is why I'm telling you this. So the focal map essentially takes um, uh, what we call tiles. So we take a, a particular uh, image of the flow cell, and we divide it into x and y coordinates. Okay, so we have a lane of a flow cell, we have a tile of a flow cell, and then we have an x and y coordinate. And the focal map, which is now generated over the first 25 uh, base pairs, um, uh, associates a unique position on the flow cell with that cluster. And that becomes very important uh, to actually uh, do all the analysis downstream. So once we've generated that focal map, uh, we then uh, essentially, uh, as I think everybody knows, uh, then do one uh, scan at a time. And then we build up the sequence from that set of images. In the bad old days of Selexa sequencing, we used to keep the images and actually push them off onto the server. This was back in 2008, 2009. But it was actually a graduate student who came up with a methodology uh, for actually de novo or, or generating the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the sequence calls on the fly. And then we, uh, we then stopped uh, storing the images. But I won't bore you with those details. Um, uh, but essentially, uh, we, we build up the sequence that way. Now, there's one consideration if you're, if you're working uh, in, in the wet lab and you're generating a library to keep in mind is that to generate a focal map, um, the, the, the nucleotide representation of your library needs to be balanced. Okay, so if you have the first position of your nucleotide, of your, of your library is all the same throughout your library, it's going to overwhelm the, the, the camera because all it's going to see, let's for example say, you added some adapter that you knew what the sequence was, but it's all the same for all the molecules in your, in your lane. The sequencer is then going to be overwhelmed because it's not going to be able to tell um, the, the, uh, uh, the discrete positions of each of the individual um, uh, clusters. So it's important that your first um, uh, nucleotides are balanced to allow it to, uh, to detect um, the individual features. And this becomes important, for example, in whole genome bisulfide data even, um, because that, of course, is, is a reduced representation. Okay. So, of course, we know we do paraden chemistry as well, just to keep in mind that paraden chemistry, so this is the first, I just discussed this, um, but paraden chemistry essentially regenerates the cluster <coughs> on the flow cell surface after we've done read one, right? So we go through the regeneration of the cluster um, uh, in read two. So read one is here. We make a single strand, we block, uh, we do the sequencing. Uh, and then we essentially regenerate the cluster, and then we cleave the other end. So those nucleotides that are grafted to the flow cell surface are chemically modified, one of which is, is, is degraded, in the, or one of which is cleaved in the first read, the other is cleaved in the second read. Okay. So very briefly, this is what happens behind the scenes. Lots of images are generated. These are generated into intensity files. Um, and... Uh, up until a few years ago, this was outputted as something called a QSeq file, uh, but now I think most of us just deal with FASTQ files, so QSeq file is an, an intermediate file. There is one metric I think that's worth um, discussing, which is the so-called chastity filtering. Are you guys familiar with this? This is something that's encoded within the FASTQ file, right, or encoded within, within the FASTQ file. Does anybody know what this is? Anybody heard of this before? Okay. So chastity is, is a way of flagging polyclonal clusters, okay? So you can imagine when you do this, because you're randomly grafting these things, or even now when we have ordered arrays uh, on the Illumina, uh, you can get cases where clusters become um, uh, mixed. In other words, you have more than one fragment associated to a particular position uh, on the flow cell, okay? Um, so you had, instead of having one, you didn't capture one, you captured two, 
uh, strands of DNA. Um, and so you need to identify those, or we want to identify those to remove those from downstream analysis. And the filtering is, and the, the flag is called chastity. This is essentially the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the algorithm that's used to, to call it. And essentially, it's very simple. It's the brightest intensity. So whatever nucleotide gives you the brightest intensity uh, over the brightest intensity plus the second brightest intensity. And this has to be greater than 0.6, uh, fairly arbitrary, over the first 25 base pairs. And one is allowed to be a failure. Um, uh, and again, that's just been determined empirically. Uh, and this essentially, as I just mentioned, flags polyclonal clusters. So you'll see the chastity filter uh, is actually encoded within the read name of your FASTQ file, right? Is that applicable to DNA methylation as well? It's applicable to all, um, all sequencing, yeah. It most, and if it's a good sequencing run, you should have very few polyclonal clusters, very few chastity failed, but it's, it's a good you know, check, right? You can grab through your file pretty quick and see how many chastity failed reads you have, right? That's always a good thing to do. Okay, so um, like Sanger sequencing, when Illumina sequencing or an NGS sequencing was first developed, we had no measure of quality. I don't know why this thing is getting all, anyway. Phil's picture got a bit big there, but anyway. Um, so uh, initially, when we, when we were doing NGS sequencing, we had no quality measures, and the only way we could measure quality was actually aligning it back to a reference genome. Um, and then from there, we could just say, well, we've got this many uh, mismatches compared to the reference, and so this is a, you know, such and such quality. Over time, we've adopted uh, the, the so-called um, FRED score, or, uh, uh, which is essentially a log transform probability. Um, and I've given you the description of how it's called for Sanger just to get you an idea. So things like peak spacing, um, you know, how, how much your, your uh, background signal, uh, uh, etc. So massively parallel sequencing or Illumina sequencing uses similar uses features such as intensity, separation from the next cluster, um, and something called phasing, which I'm not going to talk about. But if you're interested in knowing, I, I can give you uh, details on, on how phasing is determined. And so this is used to actually assign a so-called quality score, a base quality score, to each of the bases in Illumina sequencing. Okay, So that's what a base quality is. It's a log transform probability. Uh, and, and the formula is, is, is shown there. Okay? Yes? Yes. Yes. Well, you couldn't, right? So that's the problem, right? Not just a mutation, but a polymorphism. So, of course, when we were sequencing human genomes, like doing chip sequencing, and we're aligning it back to the human genome, we would see mismatches, and we would uh, we would use we would account those to be where we would count those as errors. But of course, many of those are polymorphisms. There's about you know four million positions different in your genome versus the reference, and my genome versus the reference, and so that was a problem um, with that methodology. So, but it took some time and uh, to generate this table that actually is empirically determined, and it was generated essentially by resequencing the same way it was done in Sanger, resequencing an artificial or a synthetic piece of DNA over and over and over and over and over again, and then recording the characteristics of those bases that were as expected and those that were not uh, to generate this, this lookup table, which is now used by the algorithm. And I, you know, I, I'm not going to go into the details of, of the lookup table, but just to point out that this is the quality metric. So base qualities, and as you, when Misha discusses the next module, he'll talk about mapping qualities, which are different things, right? Base quality and mapping quality are different. Base quality refers to the quality of, of the base. Okay, so um, the output of an Illumina sequencer looks something like this. You'll never see this file, but this is what goes into generating the FASTQ file. And I bring this up because the details that are up here, which are actually concatenated into the end of, or into the name of the uh, sequence in the FASTQ file, um, is what identifies that sequence read. Okay, so what we have is such things as what instrument was run on, what run it is uh, occasionally, uh, what lane, uh, and then importantly, um, and then the tile. Why isn't this not working? Anyway, so then the tile, right? So tile. And then x and y coordinate. Okay, so putting these all things together, concatenating them all together, gives you a unique ID for that read. And of course, when we 
when we generate, for example, paired end reads, or even when we associate an index to a read, that is the key that is used um, to identify that read, right? So read one is generated with one file, read two is generated as another file, and the only way we know read one and read two are associated to each other is by their x and y coordinates, right? That's the only way we know. So it's very, so that's how it's encoded. And of course, that name should be unique um, within any given run. Now, there are, there are some cases where that's not the case. Um, for example, if you do multiple runs on, on a sequencer, and let's say, for example, you're not using the instrument name or you're not using the run number, then you can actually get cases where you've got a, a conflict, where you've got, just by random chance, two reads that have the same, two independent reads that have the same X and Y coordinate and tau coordinate. And so the concept of read groups, which I think perhaps Misha will talk about, is developed. So you might have heard of read groups. Read groups are a way of then identifying that chunk of reads is in one group that has this unique identifier versus another group, and then you can merge those uh, into the downstream bound. Okay, so the, the sequence, of course, is there, and then the quality scores are there, right? So these are base quality scores. So does anybody know what these are? So I, I told you they're FRED scores, right? So log transform FRED uh, uh, probabilities, right? So why are they not? Why are they letters? Does anybody know? Or how is that encoded? Right, ASCII encoded. So they're ASCII encoded, and why do we encode them with ASCII? So just that takes less number. Yeah, very simple, right? Instead of using two digits, so FRED scores are like, for example, FRED 10, 1 in 10, right? FRED 20, 1 in 100, FRED 30, 1 in 1,000, FRED 40, 1 in 10,000, right? Instead of, instead of uh, encoding 10, 20, 30, 40, we're now encoding one base. Um, and so essentially it's just a way of saving space. Um, and the, the, the thing you need to know, of course, with ASCII is what base is encoded, right? So um, you need to know that to be able to convert it into a quality score. Now, confusingly, um, up until probably three or four years ago, I don't remember exactly when the, when the flip happened, um, Illumina used to, used to store their base qualities in base 64. Um, uh, so in some cases, although I think those are probably pretty hard to find these days, it, it might be in base 64. That's why you need to know what version of the base color was used. Um, and that's one of the parameters in the FASTQ uh, that we're going to talk about. But now everything is encoded in base 33, uh, and, and base 33 is used because uh, 32 is just a blank space. So that gets us to the FASTQ. Uh, so FASTQ, as everybody knows, is a universal standard uh, for encoding bases and base qualities. It was developed by the Sanger Center. Um, before FASTQs, we actually had FASTA files, right? And FASTA files just have strings of DNA uh, or nucleic acid strings, but no qualities associated to them. So the FASTQ file is a way of storing both the sequence and the quality. And FAST, the FASTQ file is, uh, encodes the quality scores in base 33. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, and this is the format, uh, as everybody knows. Um, so this <coughs> at in my first sequence would be that concatenated string. And we'll, we'll look at that in a second. Uh, your, your, your sequence string, there's an optional additional um, flag. Uh, and then your quality, and then you're next, and you're next, and you're next, and you're next, okay? Okay, I'm, I'm almost done. I'm supposed to end at 10, is that right? Okay, but I'll be real quick here. Okay, so now you've completed your, 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 your um, chip sequencing experiment. You've gone through the molecular biology. You've gone through the sequencing. You've got your FASTQ file. How do you assess the quality, right? This is a fundamental question. You always want to make sure that your data is good before you start doing stuff with it. So how, how, do we, how do we assess this, right? Well, three main ways. Sequencing quality, right? Is this, does the sequencing look good? How do we measure that? We can look at the base qualities, for example. And we can look at other characteristics, as we'll talk about. Library quality, what's the quality of your library, right? Um, are we seeing an equal representation of the genome? Are we seeing um, lots of duplicates, lots of PCR duplicates? Um, and IP quality. Did our amino precipitation work? Are we actually capturing regions of the genome that we expect, um, et cetera? So first, for sequencing quality, there are a number of tools out there that do this. Um, FASTQ is one that's been used by the community for almost a decade now. 
It's fairly easy to run. Um, it can be run both in command line, so you can do many um, at the same time, uh, or, or you can do it in, as, a, as a user interface. Um, and this essentially provides a, a set of analysis tools uh, that you can use to examine the quality of your data set. So for those of you that are starting out, you know, this would be a very easy tool for you to, to begin to get familiar with, with your data sets. Um, and, and that's the path to it, and it's been installed on the server, and we're going to go through it. Okay, so, so that's how we're going to look at the sequencing quality, but what about the library quality? How do we look at the library quality? So some of the characteristics that we look at, and this is um, uh, that, that you can look at, are, for example, insert size distribution. Okay, so I bring this up because um, there, there, you will see a lot of uh, variation in insert sizes, and insert size distribution actually is also dependent upon um, your immunoprecipitation conditions. Uh, certainly that's true in native chip sequencing, perhaps not so much true in cross-linking, but certainly true in native uh, chip sequencing. And so what I'm showing you here is the DNA fragment length, and this is just a distribution that was generated using the read pairs. So we've, we've aligned them to the genome, and then we've just plotted what's the average distribution. So this is the number of fragments on this axis, and this is the DNA fragment length, right? So we're just counting how many times we see, for example, you know, 100 base pairs, 200 base pairs, 200 base pairs, and we're plotting it. The black line indicates the input. So this was the chromatin that we immunoprecipitated, uh, or that we digested, but we didn't immunoprecipitate. We just shotgun sequenced it. And as Misha will discuss, uh, having the input is critical for determining your background, okay? But that's our input, right? So these black lines are our input. And then these red lines, and there's actually two different shades, which are difficult to see here, are our IPs. And the point I wanted to make here is that just by doing your IPs, you're actually shifting your, your, your uh, insert size distribution. Can anybody think why that might be? Why, would you, why, why should we see this in the data? So this is our input. Let's remember, this is the distribution of fragments that we put into the IP. This is the distribution of fragments that come out of the IP. Black is what we put in, red is what we got out. Why do we see this shift in size? Say that again? You an enrichment on the fragments, depending on the marks. Right, right. So, but, so that's interesting, right? So, so for example, though you can't see the difference in shades, you can see that actually A27 trimethylation, right, polycomb, actually is enriching for bigger fragments, larger fragments, even though it, this is what it was presented with, right? But this is what came out, right? And remember that we're giving it a, a, a distribution of fragments, right? And so, so, of course, these fragments were present in this, in the input library, but at a very low frequency. And in our input, we've actually enriched for those, highly enriched for those, right? Uh, in what we ended up sequencing on the sequencer, right? This is native chip. In crosslink chip, you don't see this shift to the same degree, but it's still present, right? So we can look at the at these distributions as a way of saying, well, you know, does this make sense? Am I seeing what do I expect? Trithorax, which is K4 trimethylation, we see uh, enrichment of lower fragments or lower smaller fragments, which might be indicative of, for example, more open chromatin, uh, where where these are being in enriched. Okay, so that's one way to do it. We can also look at the library quality by looking at uh, the aligned fractions. So how much of our reads do we align? And this is actually a screenshot from uh, our production facility. So each one of these uh, uh, bars here represents one chip seek, and this is just a, a random set of chip seek uh, sequences. And so what we do is we compare the aligned fraction of this experiment against all other experiments that we've run. Uh, and we say, well, does this fit within the distribution? You know, this is uh, around 90%. So using um, current state-of-the-art sequencing technologies and a good IP, you should expect to see greater than 90% alignment in a ChIP-seq experiment, at least when you're dealing with histone modifications. The very lowest I would say you should move forward with is 50% mappability, but there you know you, you probably have some, uh, some molecular biology um, concerns uh, to think about. Um, but, but um, so that's one characteristic. So we want to see a, a majority of uh, aligned reads. Um, uh, and I think this is just looking at it in a different context. So now we've, we've used um, a mapping quality. And I'm not going to go into that because I think 
Misha's going to talk about it. But this is essentially looking at aligned reads uh, after we strip out um, replicate reads. Of course, we can also look at PCR duplicates, right? So how many PCR duplicates do we have in our library, right? And of course, PCR duplicates are also dependent upon how deeply you sequence the library. If you completely sample the diversity of your library, right, you're going to expect to see PCR duplicates. So the more you sequence, the more duplicates you're going to see. But at the levels that, that, that we're sequencing here, which is, I said, 50 million uh, read pairs uh, for K4, 100 million read pairs for, uh, uh, for, um, or for punctate marks like K27 acetylation, 100 million reads for K36, these are the, the duplicate rates. So you can see that for good libraries, you should be in the regime of about 1%, right? 1 or 2%. You should be much more than that. If you're up in this regime here where you're at 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10%, likely either you've oversampled the diversity or you have oversampled the diversity. You might, yep, you might want to ask yourself, well, you know, am I at a sequencing depth where I expect to be oversampling the diversity of my library? If I am, uh, you know, maybe there's a problem. Maybe I over PCR, right? Maybe I've done too many PCR cycles. Okay, finally, uh, another very quick way to do it is to um, so-called look at your domain reads. So you can just look at your, um, your IP, and if you're using marks that you have expectations about their locations in the genome, you can simply uh, take those uh, and, and map out uh, where or the fraction of reads that fall within those, those domains. So for example, with H3K27 acetylation, the, the top panel, we can take in enhancer states. So all we do is we take all the enhancer states that have been published in the NIH roadmap. We have a set of coordinates, and these are easily obtainable. Um, and then you can just ask, well, how many reads are falling in these enhancer states? Uh, and this is the kind of thing you see. Um, so I can read this. I guess this is uh, 10. 10, 15 percent of my reads are falling within enhancer states, right? And you can see that it's fairly stable, although there are outliers. Uh, similarly with H3K36, so this is a mark uh, within gene bodies. If we just take protein coding genes and ask how many reads fall within protein coding genes, you can see that you know we're in the 60, 70 percent regime. Very simple way of looking at your data, convincing yourself that this IP is of good quality and worth pursuing, right? Don't just jump in, generate WIG files, and start looking at the data, right? I, I, you must look at the quality of the data before you proceed. Okay, so with that, I will stop. We'll, we'll, we will talk about additional metrics in, in Module 2 uh, with Misha. Mm -hmm.